Hey, everybody, and welcome to Ben and Nate's Questions That We Ask People on the Internet. I'm one half of your host, Nate Fay. I'm a licensed massage therapist with over 20 years of private practice. I'm also an osteopath, as well as a master myoskeletal therapist. And when I'm not in my private practice, I'm on the road presenting for Eric Dalton and the Freedom for Pain Institute. Hey everyone, I am the other half of your co-host, Ben Stone. I've been a licensed massage therapist for over 20 years. I have a wide range of experience in the massage world from working as an employee to owning my own massage practice where we employed several massage therapists. I hold the title of Master Myoskeletal Therapist and I value learning above all else. And that's why I love making this show with Nate. And hey, Nate, we have a disclaimer alert. Disclaimer alert, disclaimer alert. The opinions and views shared on the Nate and Ben show are our own and do not represent the opinions of any other person or organization that we may be affiliated with, work for, or contract with. The main purpose of this show is for entertainment and education. And if you feel that you are entertained or educated in any way, please let us know. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 16 of Ben and Nate's questions that we ask people on the internet. And we were on a little bit of a hiatus for the last six weeks or so, as I've been on the road and Ben's been busy out there on the road. So let's just catch up here for a minute. Ben, what the heck's been going on in your world, buddy? Man, what is new, Nate? I haven't seen in a little while, and I know we've both been doing some education. You have been on the teaching end. I have been on the learning end. I did a little bit of education with our friend Drew Friedman from uh, Learn to Tape, and I did some uh, kinesio taping classes, and that was that was a really great time because I've been I took his classes a few years ago, but it, it was great to get a refresher in kinesio kinesiology taping, and he does a great job of just boiling it down to the basics. So if you're looking for a kinesiology taping class, highly recommend Drew Friedman and learn to tape.com, I think is the the name of it. But tell me what you've been up to, Nate. Well, I just, before we get into that, I just, yeah, Drew, Drew's a New England, New England guy. He's a Boston guy. So he's up in my neck of the woods. And Drew used to attend our Dalton, Oklahoma seminars and do like some uh many many taping classes at our oklahoma events yeah great guy what's the latest and greatest by the way not to put you on the spot already but because this has been and nate's questions that we ask people on the internet what's the latest and greatest on taping what are they what are they talking about these days the story changes but the way that we tape hasn't changed sure you know, so i think the taping is is really more about um, you know, number one, how it lifts the skin and helps move fluids in and around, you know, the area. So helping with bruising, swelling, that kind of thing. And then we also have taping for, for pain and discomfort. So that would be along the lines of, um, creating a sensation in the body that the central nervous picks up on. You know, I, I sometimes compare it to using icy hot or something like that. It's just a sensation that the body picks up on. It's not a way to fix things. It's not a way to immobilize a, a sprained ankle or anything like that. It's just, you know, it's helping the body to get some sensation from, you know, external sensation to help it out a little bit. Spoken like a true academic. Oh, I just took the class. You know, I, I hope, I, mean, uh, I hope Drew approves. Yeah. Well, I've been on the road myself and I'm coming off of a roller coaster of a, of a tour schedule. I taught a great class last week up in New Hampshire for the New Hampshire AMTA. And I presented for two and a half days presenting the work of Eric Dalton. And I was in San Francisco on the other side of the country just a couple weeks before, or not even a, a week before that one. So I went from San Francisco, came home for a couple days and then drove right up to New Hampshire. And um, that was that was a successful class. And my second time in San Francisco, beautiful out there. Um, I went to Muir Woods, you know, and saw the big, all the big trees, the big redwood trees, and then went to the, the BV, the Buena Vista Cafe, which has uh, some interesting history. It's one of the oldest bars in San Francisco. And most notable for, uh, I guess, inventing Irish coffee. So you go in, it's like a step back in time. You know, the old wood, the old tile on the wall. Even the bartenders wore white coats with gold, you know, the gold chains across them. And they do this whole thing. It's not really a show, but the presentation. They have all these glasses lined up on the bar. And he just pours coffee up and down them. Then does the whiskey and a fresh cream on top. And, you know, and it was... Um, not an Irish coffee, you know, like that's not a drink for me, but you have to get it. And it was, it was pretty awesome. 
So a good experience out there. Great class. California is hungry for continuing education because not a lot of people are coming out there. So if you're listening and you're an educator, man, go to go to San Francisco. They're hungry for it out there and they love it. They're so happy when people come out. They're really, really grateful for for teachers coming out there. So get out there. You heard it straight from Nate. Sounds like you've been out there killing it, man. You've been on the road. How many how many weeks out of the last six weeks six weeks yeah, it was just, like, yeah crazy i don't even know how many miles that was but probably put about i don't know i don't even know probably four or five thousand miles and here there and everywhere and i'm gonna be on a little bit of a break now and then we're gearing up for mid-june to do a our annual pain in paradise in costa rica and that's eric's big workshop that's a week long and i got the news today that there's only two spots left. So probably by the time this airs, it's going to be sold out. And then I finally have, I finally have my fall schedule laid out. So I'll be back on the road in the fall. Cool. And where can people look up your fall schedule when, when you have it posted? Yeah. We'll find it on ericdalton.com. And uh, the big news is, is I'm going to be uh, presenting for the Canadian Massage Conference this year up in uh, Ontario, Canada. Well, that's big news. That's huge news, man. I'm like, I'm excited. It uh, was a huge honor to, to get asked to do that. So super, super excited. Well, how about we get into our question? Oh, you know what? I don't have a joke for this week. You don't? I don't. I totally, I was, uh, I was preparing for all this and uh, I totally forgot. Well, if you, don't, if you don't have a joke, then how about telling me what's one good thing that's happened to you this week? You know, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with it's been good weather and I, you know, I've been going out and practicing photography and I got yeah. a couple of good shots of some sunrises this week. And, you know, I just, I just love going out there, whether it's a good sunrise or not, just being out there and seeing the sun come up. That's pretty cool. Your photography has been great, man. I've noticed, uh, I've noticed huge, huge, uh, improvement in your work. I mean, it's, it's been like impressive, but it's cool to like see it evolve. I think that's something that we're going to talk about today when we get into our questions. But before we get into that, I want to ask you, what's one th good thing that's happened to you this week? Man, I think I'm just kind of happy to be home now. You know, I'm happy that uh, I love teaching. I love being on the road. And um, I love bringing that work to massage therapists that, uh, that attend. But I'm just happy to be home. I've had a good couple days back in my practice. Uh, yesterday and today, a couple full days of great people, good successes. Yeah, I, I just think it's kind of getting back to a little bit of downtime. Whatever downtime means being a business owner, but... <laughs> Yeah. So what are we talking about this week? What's happening this week? You know, so we put out a question a while back and then we kind of uh, were doing our own things. You were on the road and I was learning some kinesiology and uh, taping and yeah. whatnot. But we're going to go back to a few weeks ago and we asked, we posed this question and I'm just going to read the question how we posed it. What qualities make a good massage therapist and what qualities make a bad massage therapist? That's a big question. It is a big question. Where to begin? You know, normally what I ask you is why did you decide to ask this question, Nate? <laughs> but I'm going to Uno reverse card you because you picked up the slack while I was away. So Uno reverse card, Ben. I had a feeling you were going to ask me that. So I tell you what, um, it's it's an interesting question that was posed to me in a group that I was that I've been working with. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but I just thought it was an interesting question. How what are the qualities that make a good massage therapist and a bad massage therapist if you were in the business of making massage therapists? Mm -hmm. So uh, say a school type environment. But you know, you and I are both in a position where we have the potential to influence influence and educate people about what qualities make a good massage therapist and what qualities potentially make a not so good massage therapist. So I thought it would be something that would be interesting to, you know, discuss, not that we know everything about what makes a good or a bad massage therapist, but you and I have both been around long enough that we have seen our share of good and bad, I think. And so that we can, we can talk about it and, and maybe help some other massage therapists. So that was my thought behind the question. Well, I think with everything you just said, I think this episode is going to be about four and a half hours long now. We'll try to whittle this down. My first thoughts, my first thoughts to everything that you just said, let's, is like, I almost want to go back in time. 
right, to when I attended school. And what were the goals? Were the goals to make me a good massage therapist or were the goals to get me passing the licensure exam? What were the goals of the school back then? Yeah. You know, right, right, and thinking about that, I think at the time that I attended school, I actually attended, in hindsight, I attended a really great school. It was a private, private institution. It was founded by massage therapists for massage therapists. Um, and the time frame that I attended, they brought in, they also were bringing in continuing education and kind of the who's who of the massage world, you know, from yesterday and today would, would come out to Connecticut and would come out to New England. The reality was, while I had a lot of great education, the goal was to get you to pass your licensure test, right? For these schools to probably hold on to their accreditation. The goal was to have a high, a high pass rate. The business class, the business portion of our massage program, I can remember it to this day, was really, really poor, right? They did not prepare you to come out and, you know, know what to do. There were certainly no 20 years ago, there weren't franchises there was nowhere to go get a job i couldn't just go to massage envy and get get a job you were you were totally on your own sort of going out and doing those first couple massages you come out of school thinking you're amazing thinking you're the best and then you realize that people don't rebook they don't come back but you don't know why so back to your comment about what what are our goals now are we trying you know like you and i what are our goals are we trying to make good massage therapists by listening to our podcast yeah absolutely that's where i want to start i, I love it um and i want to even go back even further back in time and i'm just going to pose the question what innate qualities of a person would make a good massage therapist so you know if you're not cut out to be a massage therapist and you go to massage therapy school, are you already set up for failure to begin with? If you're not interested in anatomy, physiology, kinesiology, all that, all the ologies, I mean, are you going, are you, are you going to succeed? And then, you know, maybe the goal of school is to, yeah, to get you to pass your exam, but to create an entry level massage therapist that can then follow whatever course they want to follow from school. They have the base knowledge where then they build on it from there. I mean, there's there's a lot of ways we could go with this. Yeah, that, that, I think that's just like a good, a good thought, you know, going back in time. So what, if we were to put, have a bucket, and we were to throw like just a bunch of maybe words into that bucket of what would make a good massage, say so back to your question, right? What qualities would, would we want in a massage therapist? Yeah, so starting off, I think, for a good massage therapist, that's where I want to start. Does that sound all right with you? I love it. Let's yeah. do it. So, I mean, one word that comes to mind is passion. Absolutely. And I don't know that you you realize that whether you are passionate about massage when you're in massage school, but I think it should it should show itself at some point, whether you feel like you're drawn to the profession during school or not. And that should guide you as to whether, hey, maybe this is something I want to do or, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a little secret. When I decided to go to massage school, I decided, yeah, this is going to be a thing I do for in the meantime, till I figure out what I want to be when I grow up. Sure. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> but um, in the meantime, I'm still doing massage 20 years later. Yeah, this is it for me. You know, unless something devastating is to happen. I mean, this is what I'll be doing. I was thinking about this. It's funny that you brought that up, that 20 year thing. And I was thinking about it today that, you know, I'm 47 at the time of this recording, just in case people are listening to this some 20 years from now. So, right, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pushing that 20 year mark. And I think about like my dad's generation, right? Where, you know, you looked at the average career of being like 30 years till you retire, age 65. But I'm like, man, that's like, so like another 20 years. So I'm like, I could potentially be doing this for another 20 years. And in my, in my head, it actually, it makes sense to me. Yeah, I don't see that as, I actually see that as like a pretty exciting thing. You know, I think about, you know, and, and just because it's uh, relevant, right? I think about some of the longtime teachers in our field that have been around doing this since the, the mid 80s and 90s and are still out there writing and doing it. So back to that whole passion thing. That just reminded me of something like when I got out of massage school and I can remember almost feeling, I don't know why, because I knew I wanted to do it. I knew that I would grow to love this field, even though I didn't know why. But I remember in those early stages, I remember feeling like weird talking about it. When people ask me like what I did, because it was like goofy 20 years ago. 
It was hard you know, to admit that that's what you did. Is, well, that, was, is that what you're saying? I was totally hard to admit that. You know, people would make fun of you. Of course, all the classics, you know, jokes. And I don't know if that meant that I wasn't passionate about it, but maybe not. You know, maybe I wasn't at that time. I don't know, hard to say. I think with time and growth of our own industry and growth of a lot of things, you know, I know how you talk about it, like when we talk about this together and how passionate we are about all these subjects that we bring up. And I can bet you, I've never been in your practice, but I bet you your, your clients hear that with you and get excited to see you, you know, and when my clients are with me and I get excited to talk about this stuff and... You know, I always say I'm going to nerd out for a minute or, you know, go on about something and people get excited about that stuff because they see that you're smiling and you're happy about it. And Absolutely. There's not been a day in the last 20 years where I have never wanted to go to work. I mean, I've had days where I'm sick and of sure. course I don't want to go when, when I'm sick, but I have never got up in the morning and said, man, I do not want to go into work today. Never thought that ever. Yeah. I've never had a case on the Mondays. So I can yeah. safely say that. I've had my days too, we're sure. A little tired, feeling under the weather, but I've never had a case of the Mondays. Monday rolls around and I'm actually like up and at them, ready to go. Yeah. And, and as we talk about passion, I want to throw this out there because um, it just reminded me, you know, I'm going to put a, I'm going to put in a little plug for the Dalton workshops. You know, the first time I attended back in 2016, 2017, something like that, the passion in the room, you could see it. Everybody that attended, I mean, I, I felt like I came home. I was like, look at all these people. They are, they are big nerds like I am. And they're, they're yeah. even bigger nerds than I am. Like, I don't even know if I fit in this room or not, but everybody was so cool at that first um, Oklahoma city workshop that I went to. So I, I just want to put a plug out there for, I, and I don't do this very often. I let you handle the, the Eric Dalton stuff, but you know, Costa Rica, I think it'd be a great thing. If you're passionate about massage, that would be a definite, um, Thing for you to go to for sure and it's it's interesting and um you know I, I was talking about this today uh, with one of my clients he's a musician that came in today and we we're talking about the quality of musicianship right and i think a lot of this is because of right our, our access to information you and i did not have the internet 20 years ago there would be no ben and eights questions that we ask people on the internet and you and i in our early days post getting our license right we were kind of like on our own to find find these classes, figure out these techniques, you know, colleagues were, I had no colleagues. I had nobody to call on. I had no, you know, I was figuring out everything on my own. And now with um, the amount of content, regular people, influencers, regular people like you and I put out, you know, the bigger names that are putting out there, you know, technique videos. So I've noticed not only the quality of therapists just getting so much better, Right. So my client and I were talking about musicians and same thing, the, the, the quality of a musician now because of access to information and learning is like it's really going through the roof. And I think that a lot of these forums like, you know, social media, podcast, Facebook, right, have, have given us also an outlet to, you know, be in these group situations and be, you know, have that passion. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing with photography. I have all this access to YouTube videos to help me learn and I'm still looking for a mentor. I, I need someone that I can go to and just ask the question because you can search YouTube all day or Google, but you may not get that answer. So you need a mentor. I feel like you need someone to go to, but yeah, I'm, I'm right with you there. This access to information has made, made a lot of people better if they're passionate about what they do. For sure. Because then they're willing to go that extra step and look it up on the internet. How can I improve myself? Let's go to the next one that I wanted to talk about. I'm going to call it technical skills. And that's kind of a no brainer. You got to have some technical skills to be a, a good massage therapist. Yeah. You know, what are those technical skills? Knowledge of anatomy, physiology, kinesiology. You need to know some of those things. And as we talked about in the past, what do we do to get better? What are we doing to improve ourselves as massage therapists? Think about this. If, if you're a bass player and you go home and you practice your E major chord every day, and that's all you do every day, even though you're practicing, does that really mean you're improving? You're getting better at playing at one chord. How is it that you're evolving as a massage therapist, evolving with your technical skills and right. challenging yourself to get better, getting outside of just playing E major? 
all the mm-hmm. time. Yeah, that's right. And um, since you brought it into music, that was one of it, the best lesson I ever had. And the instructor looked at me and he said, do you love music? And I said, I love music. He says, do you love your bass? I said, of course. I said, I love my bass more than anything else. And then he said, tell me how many notes are on your instrument, right? And anyone that knows anything about music, your initial thought would be 12, right? There's 12 notes in the musical scale. And he said, you don't love your instrument. You don't love music. You can't even tell me how many notes are on your instrument, right? It's four strings. There's 24 frets, 22 frets. There's 84 notes on my instrument, right? Give or take, whatever the math is. And I often think about that. You know, I relate a lot of my music training back to massage therapy, right? Like how much do you love massage? How passionate are you? You know, how many muscles in the human body? Discs, vertebrae, you know, joint, you know, whatever the case is. And then you could take it from there. But that's also back to passion, right? But technical skills, the art of touch, right? Sure. How you place your hands on somebody, right? How you start your session, how you end your session. Technique is maybe applicable in that moment of uh, affecting somebody and how they want to be affected. It's probably, it's it's not probably, it's, it's bigger than that. I met Art Riggs down in Oklahoma City. You know Art Riggs. Yeah. Art Riggs wrote the book, The Visual... Visual Guide to Deep Tissue Techniques, I think is what it's called. And in the book, he talks about touch. And he says, hey, I want you to do this experiment. And I've done this experiment. And I I love that I did this. You take cornstarch and water, put in a pan, and you work your way through the cornstarch and water. I mean, just that sensation of slowly going through tissues and seeing what tissues will do if you go quickly. I kind of already had an idea of how all that worked, but you know, it's just another way to learn touch. And you know, that's another way that you evolve as, as a manual therapist. Clients can tell, you know, even though, even if clients don't exactly know what we're doing throughout their session, right? Clients can, clients can tell how you're working. You know, they can tell how you're using your body, the thought you're putting into it, even if you're being nonverbal, you know, there's, there's that nonverbal connection that, that happens in every session and clients know when you're just plowing through barriers or not giving them what they need, or maybe your touch and your technique just doesn't make any sense at all. And then that goes back to how do we improve? Cause not, you know, you didn't come out of massage school with the touch you have today. And in five years from now, you're not going to have the same touch in five years from now that you have today. You're going to keep evolving, or at least I hope you are because I know who you are and I, I'm pretty sure you're going to keep evolving. Well, it's an interesting thing because, you know, even, even though I teach more than I take classes, right? Cause it's, I'm, I'm like on this weird thing where it's harder for me to take classes cause I'm spending a lot of my free weekends teaching. But I, I noticed that when I come back to my practice, I've even evolved in my own hands-on skills. Like I was thinking about how I was working yesterday and today. And it was interesting cause a lot of my regular clients that come and see me, they're like, man, you're on, you're like on fire today. You know, so they could tell there's this like difference. And I always feel that just by teaching what I'm doing after a couple days, right, translates back to my own practice and still, you know, ups, ups the game. Yeah. In order to teach people something, you have to have a different understanding of it, maybe a more deeper understanding of it in order to teach two different students, because not everyone learns the same. And so that in turn, maybe ups the level of Nate's techniques and Nate's touch. Yeah. So I like that. What about, um, I know you have more. Oh, I have more. Can I throw one in? Absolutely. It's been our theme for the last 16 episodes. Yes. You know what it is listening. Yes. That's my favorite topic. So I put that one under the, under the broad category of communication skills. Okay, we can come back to it. Yeah, but I mean, no, listening listening is part of that. Tell me what qualities of listening would make a good massage therapist. Well, you know, every session, from the first session, right, hearing your client's story, taking a look at their intake, knowing how to bring them into their story, right, and then letting them explain why they've had low back pain for the past seven years, the who, what, why, where, when, and how, and not making any, not interrupting, not, not making assumptions, even with your own body language, not making assumptions, the classic 
not listening to respond, right? And just letting, letting them lay everything out on the table. And I think this actually goes back to technical skills, the last two categories that we just talked about, right? And then knowing what to do next. And one of the things that I'll say in my own classes is that if you have 15 people in a week that all come in with low back pain, you know, I always say, ask yourself the question, how varied are your sessions, right? How different are your sessions from point A to point A to B, how you've assessed them, what techniques you've used and how you've listened to them. And if you listen to them, you know, they will, in a lot of ways, steer you in the right direction. They'll actually drive the session more than you as a therapist are driving it. So I think listening is huge, not making assumption, oh, your low back hurts well, it's your psoas, it's your rectus, you know, whatever muscle you want to blame in that moment. And we've been through this time and time again. That's just something that evolves over time anyway. Because I know five years ago, I was playing the blame game too. Oh, it's these three muscles that we have to look at and treat today, every time. But over time, that develops, right? I attended a uh, Tom Myers class on assessment several years ago. And I said, you know what? That's what I'm lacking is assessment. And so... The next, the next person, you know, that next Monday, I said, let's assess, let's, I just want to assess you. And I had them stand in front of me and I just looked at them. It was the scariest thing I'd ever done. Cause it, that was not what I was taught in massage school. I was not taught in assessment. I looked at them and I saw nothing, but in their eyes, I was now more credible because I was doing something that no other massage therapist had done. This person is looking at me and, you know, I didn't, I, you could say, oh, I'm judging them or whatever. No, I'm not judging. I'm just, you know, I've evolved how I talk to people when I assess them. Like, oh, is my posture bad? You know, you get all those things, but you got to start somewhere, learn and evolve. So just because, just because you're listening to this podcast right now and you're not incorporating any type of assessment, which you probably are, you just don't realize it doesn't mean you're a bad massage therapist. You're just, you just learn and evolve. We're not going to put not assessing clients under a bad massage therapist. We're just, we're just talking about it. Every class I ask the question, how many people in the class do assessments in their practice? And the numbers are always interestingly less than half of people that do. That's just an interesting thought. But I think by the end of class, like you said, people are assessing more than they know. Your technique itself, your technique is your assessment. And sometimes that's all you need. But listening, man, I think listening is, is uh, huge. Yeah, listening. So we, you know, you you nailed it. Listening, taking the health history. You know, assessments are a part of listening. You're listening with your eyes. You're listening with your touch. But also, um, you know, and I I put this under the big broad category of communication skills. Some of the the attributes of a good massage therapist is that they can they can deal with some of these things like that I'm going to call drama. And so that would be a client showing up late, or a no show, or someone's check that bounces something like that i think that's important to be able to to deal with and it's not fun nobody likes to do it but it's part of you know i'm going to say it's being a, a sole practitioner you're not going to have to do this if you work at a you know at a facility that you're employed at we don't have um it's, a, it's another question i ask every class i'm like how many people have a front desk person nobody Nobody does. And back in the day when I worked for the chiropractor, right? And he taught me a lot, you know, and a lot of stuff that we talked about has rolled over across my last, you know, umpteen years doing this. But like your front desk person's like your bad guy. Like they get to be the bad guy and they get to be the one that say, oh, you know, he's a jerk or she's a whatever. And then they come back and they see you, the expert, and they're happy to see you. And so when it comes time to raising your prices or billing them for a session, you know, it's no longer Nate or Nate or Ben's the bad guy. It's all that mean front desk person, but we don't have that, man. We have like this weird dual role. One of my jokes is, is, you know, I, I laugh with my clients. I say, you know, one day I said, I'm never going to clean toilets again. And here I am cleaning toilets, right? At the end of my week on Friday, I clean the bathrooms every, you know, <laughs> but anyway, but it's like a hard thing, you know, like I, I just did a price increase, you know, so I'm going up and I don't like to do like an email blast. I like to talk to my clients individually. Like, so as I'm checking them out, that's just how I prefer to do it. And after all these years, man, it's like the, I hate it. I absolutely hate doing it, but you have to do it. Yeah. Well, here's a plug for a future episode that we're going to have. 
We're going to talk about raising prices. So that's going to be a fun one. Yeah. But, you know, doing all those things or, you know, you missed your session, right? And making that decision. I particularly found, just as a side note, that I send out a new patient email right after somebody books, they get an email that just lays all this stuff out. It lays every last detail out right from like how much your initial sessions are, how much these sessions are. What, uh, what you can expect from a time frame standpoint, directions, parking, how to enter the office. And what happens if you no show a session and particularly as a new client, I may not be able to charge you, but I may not be able to rebook you anyway, but whatever other people do, that's your business. But at the same time, it's, it's hard being the bad guy. And then it's hard going in the, a 12 by 12 room with these people, right? For the next 45, 50 minutes. Well, you nailed it. And we've talked about it in the past. It's setting expectations, setting all the rules that someone can expect when they come see you. And that is just one of the things that helps people put people more at ease when they come to your office. They yeah. know what to expect. They know you park here, you do this, you do that. And when they come, they're more relaxed because, hey, this is what they told me what would happen. This is what happened. Oh, okay. It's all following the, the expectations. And that in general is going to help with therapeutic outcomes, or at least so says the, uh, the researcher down in, in Australia, Mark Bishop. I don't know if you well, listened to that podcast from uh, Whitney and uh, Till. I actually didn't, and I'm not familiar with that name, but it makes me feel like I know what I'm doing because I'm writing about that stuff in my book without even knowing that stuff. So <laughs> well, there you so. go. You've got someone to research from Mark Bishop out of, um, he's a physical therapist out of Australia. It, it reduces greatly. I've learned that by doing that, all that stuff up front, it reduces probably my guess is almost 99% of any sort of possible failure from the no show to having the charge to, to somebody to having to fire a client. You know, that stuff is almost non-existent in my office now since I've implemented that model over the past five to eight years. And I actually, you know, you mentioned Whitney and Till stuff, but that was back to my old days working with a chiropractor day. A lot of those chiropractic seminars that I used to attend were basically all about how to train your patient how to train your patient at day one, how to make, uh, I went to seminars, how to make a good patient, right. And learn, learned a lot of that stuff. And it's, but it's true, you know, yeah. and it works. It works. Well, let's see. I've got another, another category that I'm going to bring up of qualities that make a good massage therapist. And I'm going to call this one professional standards. And what I mean by this is doing things that a professional would do. You know, I'm going to say looking the part, you know, you're not wearing Daisy Dukes when somebody walks in to get work done by you. You're speaking professionally. You're using professional products. You are, there's, there's a lot of things that if you act professional, people are going to treat you professional and just that's going to raise your credibility right there. I've always believed, right, being, being self-employed, being, uh, being your own business owner, it's easy to maybe fall into traps of wearing whatever you're comfortable with going to, you know, if we just start with dress, you know, years ago, I, I just made it a point to have a uniform, just like any other job, black t-shirt, black scrub pants with my name on it and my credentialing on it and that's just something i've been doing and it's a no-brainer i don't have to pick out my outfit every day i got five black pants five black t-shirts ready to go you know but um there's the other but many massage therapists like you like myself we have clients that are going to see us for the rest of our lives and the rest of their lives like literally You've been in this practice long enough, and I've been in this practice long enough where I have seen my clients age. I've had clients die, right? I've seen them long enough where they probably had seven clients in the past year die. That's how long they've been seeing me, 20 plus years. I've seen clients, um, you know, younger clients have kids. When I saw them through their pregnancy, they're 12, 13, 14 year olds to come in and have me check their back, right? And then on the, on the same on the same turn, they've gotten to know my life. And that's just, well, you're in the room for a long time with somebody. I mean, clients saw me through my divorce. They saw me through my dad dying. They knew all that was going on. And it's very hard to hide when you're in the room for 45, 50, or, you know, an hour, whatever you spend with somebody. So there, there definitely is a crossover of blurring those lines of, 
I guess, what would potentially be in the, the realm of ethical standards. As we say, doing every, not everything, but doing some of the things they told you not to do in massage school, bonding with your clients, getting to know their families, you know, that sort of thing. I found it not only hard to avoid that stuff, but in a positive manner, I found that it's seemingly the right thing to do, right? Because I think it also develops a different kind of trust as well. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. You know, in massage school, it was uh, don't get to know your clients. You know, don't don't tell them about your personal life. Now there's social media. Don't let them friend you on social media. I'm like, shit, be my friend on social media. You know, I've got nothing to hide. And then sometimes how you talk. I mean, my last client of the day today is a affluent lawyer, right, for the state courts. She's talking to me about death metal tonight and some of her favorite bands in the death metal scene. And so why I was like, man, this is like wild, the industry that we're in. Yeah, we do get to hear some things that probably a lot of people in their circle would not ever hear. You know, maybe, right. maybe we probably have been privy to stuff that not even their own spouse would hear. And I mean, to me, I feel that, um, you know, I'm honored that they would uh, share that with me. I don't take that lightly. And, you know, I treat it very confidentially a lot of times, you know, um, not that I would tell any, you know, that I know anybody that I would tell, but still, you know, it, it is a big honor that to feel like they, they trust me enough to share those types of things about their lives. It's a huge honor. And I'm actually glad that you said that because I don't know why, but it's only maybe in the last couple of years that's been sort of ringing differently with me. But confidentiality is important. It's a weird thing in our world too, because there's not, what is it, hippo, hippa, hipper, something like I that. I like hippo, let's go with hippo. Hippo, yeah, hippo, <laughs> hippo, is it four, is there four A's in that or just one A or two A's? But it's like a weird thing, right? Because you have spouses, partners, family members that come and see you. So it's very natural for them to say, oh, how's my wife or how's my husband or how's my daughter's back doing? And that's always, that happens a lot, right? Happens to you, doesn't it? And it's like a weird moment of like this. And, I, and I've and i had to admittedly learn the art of the pause and say to them, ah, you should ask them next time you talk to them. Whereas maybe a few years ago, you know, Nate would have been like, ah, oh, they're doing great. But then you realize, man, that could be like, that could be like devastating, you know? You know, we're not bound by any confidentiality rules in that instance, as far right. as I understand. We're not. We're not, but. But, you know, it is, it is better to, you know, you don't know the relationship between the two, or you might, but um, I just usually err on the side of caution and I say, yeah, they were in recently, but you should talk to them about it. And again, I think that clients, whether they've been seeing us for three visits or they've been seeing us for five years, I think... I think they'll sit on that and also deeply respect that. And it's another mark of being what makes a good therapist. A mark of holding that professional standard. What if we go into what makes a, a not so good massage therapist? And, you know, we could take everything that we talked about and kind of flip those around. Um, but also, you know, there's a couple of specifics that I kind of want to throw out there. But first off, you know, I want to maybe just ask you, because we've all had an experience with a good massage therapist. Maybe not all of us have had an experience with a bad massage therapist, but can you think of an example that you could that you would want to share that you had with a less than stellar massage therapist? I mean, that's that's a no-brainer. This goes back to the conversation of how how the how the world of massage is changing, how we talk to our clients, how we listen to our clients, what we think about in our practice, what we're affecting, what we're not affecting. So one of my biggest pet peeves has become like when you go to like a massage therapy convention or a class, right? You're a room full of your colleagues and practitioners. And man, one of the biggest things I hate is someone coming up to me or somebody else and being like, oh man, I could tell you need body work. I was watching the way you walk and you need body work. And I hate that. And I hate it for a lot of reasons, but I hate it for the same reason that I think my clients would, anyone would hate it. Because it makes me feel bad about myself, like there's something wrong with me. You know what I mean? And you don't realize that words like that can have a profound impact on somebody, right? And I see that far too often. So with that being said, I have a incredibly huge scar on my abdomen. I had a massive surgery about 15 years ago. I had a tumor. It's not a tumor, but it was a tumor in my small intestine. A six-inch tumor. So they splayed me open, laid all my guts out, and uh, took this baby out. 
it was it wasn't cancerous man so it's left me with like a like a little bit of like body like dysmorphia right like just this scar you know it's left me with like a distended abdomen you know like all this kind of stuff you know and people make comments about that i had a massage therapist make a comment to me one time while she was working on me freaking killed me you know what i mean and it, that was like that was like the worst thing ever so her technique was fine her skills were good she was doing a great massage until she got to this point you know made a comment about my scar and made a comment about my abdomen and it was like over and I was like, damn, you know, that really sucked. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's my, that's my bad experience. And that's lived with me for, that was like, you want to believe that is like 10, over 10 years ago. And that has lived with me, burned a hole in my brain. <laughs> We've talked about it in the past, man. Words matter. Words yeah. matter. And think about how you can affect someone on your table with the words that you choose. It's like one sentence, one, one sentence. And it was just killed it, crushed it. It also made me think of a client I had too. I had a client come in my office one day, really just a beautiful young woman, great, you know, uh, you know, athletic, a yoga practitioner, yoga teacher. And she had like just all the qualities of, you know, just a very, you know, what we would consider like a very just strong, strong, beautiful young woman. She comes to my practice and she's in tears. And I was like, what, you know, what's going on with you today? And she says, well, I just came from my chiropractor and they just told me how messed up and how distorted I looked. And there she was in the most perfect textbook posture that you could imagine. And I was like looking at her and I was like, Oh my God, I'm like, you are like the cover of a yoga book, you know? And I couldn't believe that this guy, this chiropractor told her this to make a patient. That's what it was all about, to make a patient. And I had to talk her off the ledge and had a good conversation with her and turned it around. But anyway, what uh, what's a bad what's a bad thing in your mind? You know, I made a point of going and getting massage from someone that I don't know about every quarter. Once a quarter, I did this for a couple of years. I, I, since COVID I've, I've gotten out of the, the habit of doing this. And I tell you what, I, I don't know how to describe it. You run across all gamuts of massage therapy. Typically when I go to someone that I don't know, I'm going to say that, you know, it's more along the lines of a beginner massage therapist and beginner massage, which is fine. My intent was to meet people that do what I do, but this one particular instance, you know, I walked in and this kind of goes along the lines of um, being a professional and I walked into the room and I, you know, I scanned the room and it was one of those, okay, go in the room and get yourself on the table sort of thing. You know, so I was like, okay, great. Um, I scanned the room. I look at the uh, offerings of lotions that this person had. It was one lotion and it was Jergens hand lotion. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> no, they're not going to, no, they're not going to use that. <laughs> sure enough. I don't know if you've ever had copious amounts of <laughs> hand lotion put on your back, but it turns into a gelatinous goo that is just, <laughs> <laughs> it is not a pleasant sensation. Um, you know, so I've had plenty of others, but that's just one that kind of sticks out to me is like, you know, if you're going to be a professional, use professional products, use professional language, dress professionally, all of that kind of stuff. Well, you know, the teenage boy in me wants to make a comment, but I guess I we, we got to keep our ratings at, a, at an all audience level, right? Uh, when I put these podcasts up, it asks me what the rating is. So, we'll yes. keep it. so, <laughs> so I guess as the quality of a bad massage therapist, we could kind of throw that in there as, you know, poor, poor professional standards, would yeah. kind of make a bad massage therapist as long as, and and also we kind mm -hmm. of talked about technical skills so someone just starting out may not necessarily be a bad massage therapist they just are evolving we can kind of mention that also one of the first things we talked about was passion and so i think one of the the opposite is losing your passion or losing interest and we've kind of seen those people they i think they end up at the dmv at some point you can tell that they're just they're just clocking in and clocking out they're not they're not they don't they see you but they don't hear you and they're like right. yeah i'm just gonna work on this person that you know that happens right it's it's a routine it's man you could predict their session that's the other thing i say in my classes right like man you have to make your sessions unpredictable. Like for those people that, have, that are your lifers, your day one, right? They've been seeing you for since day one. They've hung in there. And I have a couple of those people 
And I love, um, is one of them in particular, she's literally been seeing me since day one and she hung in there through my early days of finding my way to probably some of my worst sessions. And she hung in there for some reason and believed in me. And I love every time she sees me, she says, Nate, you never do the same thing twice. She goes, I never know what you're going to do in your session. And I love that. And I say, I always use that as, as an example in my classes. And this is like a little bit of relationship advice, right? It's the same thing for your, your loved ones, your partners, your spouses, whatever, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, gotta be unpredictable. I will say, get those tearaway cowboy pants. And they, they're like, man, you've never done that before. Not your clients, but your loved ones at home. Keep it unpredictable. So not only are you getting free massage advice, you're getting relationship advice here tonight on Ben and Nate's questions that we ask. I people. mean, can you get any better than that? Can you get any better than this? this double but, duty here. Yeah, so I want to say something about your last category of professionalism. We talked about professional dress, presenting yourself, confidentiality, you know, and, and like like sense too, right? So, you know, we all remember that one classmate in massage school that was the smoker. That was like, nobody wanted to work with them because it was like, man, the sticky, clammy, gross, the smell, you know, the worst. It's like you're the journey song. If you're the journey song, cigarettes and cheap perfume, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if you're that lyric, no, nobody wants you working on them. But I think luckily in 2024, I see less smokers now anyway. So I don't know if that's really, maybe vapors, maybe you smell like cotton candy or something. I want to go back to your comment that you made about um, varying the session a little bit and not doing the same thing over and over. And I kind of want to relate that to a restaurant experience where you go to McDonald's and you get the number two every time. So if you go to Sally, you know, you're, you're, she's going to do the same thing every time. But I also want to pose the question, does that mean that they're a bad, that makes a bad massage therapist? I mean, if they are really good and what is that, what is that um, massage place? Is it in Florida? Esalen? Esalen? Yeah, yeah. They get trained on how to perform, you know, a sequence, a routine. Everyone there does. And they all do the same thing. So it doesn't matter when you come and who you see, you're going to get the same thing. I don't necessarily think that's a good thing for massage, but I don't know that it necessarily makes a bad massage therapist. You know, it, maybe not, right? Um, you know, there's some studies about, you know, uh, predictability and therapeutic outcomes, right? So if the brain can predict what you're going to do, then, you know, therapeutic outcome becomes down. But I guess if your therapeutic outcome is to just like veg out and the therapist just has beautiful strokes and can kind of really put you out, maybe there's no really, you know, no big goals kind of a thing. I don't, yeah, maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't make a bad therapist, but does it make somebody that, well, after eight sessions and you have goals, my low back hurts and it's the same thing every time and I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah, that blurs the line. Are they a bad therapist or are they just not a skilled therapist? Like, yeah, their hands are great. They're doing great work, but it's just not working for me. Yeah, and there's, there's a difference between approaches. Do we have a specific goal or is our goal to relax? Which I think both are valid and we have a lot of different people listening to us. So you and I both tend to lean toward the more, I don't know what to call it, therapeutic side, clinical side, where where we see people who have issues and they want help with a specific issue. They don't just typically walk in and go, ah, just do what you want. I just, I just need to veg out for the next, you know, 45 minutes. Yeah. It, it's, it's an interesting thing because well, maybe in that same category, and I've been thinking about this all day leading up to our recording tonight, have you ever had somebody not come back and see you, right? The great Ben Stone or not come back and see me. I'm sure that I've worked on plenty of people, even in my recent years, that were like, eh, that Nate guy, man, he was, he was not good. But I can also try, and I'll never know why, and you'll never know why, right? If you've ever had somebody leave your practice, you'll never necessarily know why. But I don't think you're, you're not a bad therapist. I know I'm not a bad therapist, but there's certainly people that may have left there thinking that was a bad experience, or they're a bad therapist. Think about how valuable that would be to know that information, why they didn't want to come back. Yeah, it's, it would, I think it would be pretty valuable, you know, when somebody quote unquote self dismisses, right. Especially if they've been seeing me for a long time, 
I like to follow up with an email and one of the things that I say in, in the email and I always say, you know, I say it was great working with you. It was great helping you for X, Y, and Z and totally understand I'm, I'm here for you down the road. But if there's anything that I said or did that may have caused you to self dismiss, I said, I'm always open to feedback so that I can improve, continue to improve as a therapist. And I'm probably hundred percent of the time people are like, Oh no, man, I just don't need to come and see anymore. I feel better. Right. <laughs> That's the best outcome. But at the end of the day, it's still kind of an interesting thing that even some of the, the best of the best of the best, you know, someone out there could be saying they're not the best. They're, they're actually the worst experience I've ever had. We get attached to our people, right? We, we get to learn about them. We get to know about them. And when we don't see them, I like to know, Hey man, I'm doing better. I don't need to see you anymore. You know, versus just, you know, them ghosting you. It hits you in the feels if you don't see somebody. But that was another, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it a category that would be a, a quality of a, of a bad massage therapist would be communication skills. So we have good communication skills and we have bad communication skills. All right, so Nate, I want to go back to this uh, category and flip it around the communication skills because you can have good communication skills and poor communication skills. And in my fumblings around the internet on the Facebook groups and whatnot, I, I run across um, instances where massage therapists talk about, oh, I gave this great massage, but I don't think the client liked it. I get passionate about this one because I don't think there should be a question whether the client likes it or not. Um, because if you're doing the right things during the session and you're checking in and you're testing and retesting and you're asking the client, hey, especially this, this is, this is one of the greatest questions that anybody can ask. When you get close to the end of the session, you say, Hey, did we address the things that you came in to see me for? Is there anything that we missed? Is there anything that needs more attention? How are you feeling? Are we getting to the stuff? And that, those are, I mean, those are questions that I, that um, I've been building on for years. And then I met Walt Fritz and he gave me another level to those questions and how to check in with people. But we get taught in massage school to not talk to our clients, only only speak and less spoken to, no. right? And I think that's the biggest pile of baloney that there is. Now, I don't think you you know you you need to have a big long conversation about politics or their vacation. It should all be body centered. It should all be centered around what you're doing, what they're feeling, how they're reacting, if it's connected to why they're there all those kinds, of, it should revolve around them. Hmm. But I mean, I talk almost the whole, almost the whole time, not the whole time, but I'm always checking in. What does this feel like? Tell me this, tell me this. There is the, the opposite side to communication skills. You can, I mean, you can work on somebody and not talk for 60 minutes. And I don't know. I, I think that changes the therapeutic value of a massage. If you're not you know, checking in minimum with like, Hey, talk to me about the pressure. Do we need to use more or less? What's your body saying? That kind of thing. What a weird, what a weird thing that was hammered into people like us, right? In massage school. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, what happens if I talk in a session with my client, like freak out, storm out, you know, it was just this, you didn't know what would happen. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. And the poor clients laying there thinking that this is how, you know, they're getting hurt the whole time and, or maybe you're just not hitting their goals. Whatever the case is, something's not happening. They're not saying anything because they're like, in their mind, they're like, well, if you're the expert. And then you as the experts going, well, I'm not saying anything because they're the expert. <laughs> right. And it just becomes this whole thing. And I'm with you, man. There is a lot of communication in my sessions and really understanding how to ask ask the questions the right way how to play off it's almost like a tennis game not a match but a game of a you know how you interact with that person but i can't imagine any sort of session without like any sort of communication that's like weird it's so weird that that's taught in massage schools and to this day people in my classes will say to me well you know, how do you do all this stuff? Because I'm not supposed to talk to my client in my session. And I'm like, that's a bummer that, that it's just, it's not their fault. It's just been drilled into them. And I remember that, you know, I remember that from the first day. And if anything, it's the opposite. 
it's like the whole music thing that you're supposed to play like whale whale noises and yeah and you're singing whale noises and then i remember like one day i was like man if, if i'm gonna be doing this 40 years to like listen to something that's gonna also like appeal to me and i started playing like stuff that i dig like you know maybe like acoustic blues rock coffee house stuff and when i did that changeover i remember clients saying to me man i have clients to, to this day like joke they'll look at me and they go they, they go i actually only pay you to come and listen to music for now you know like the time and i'm like hey whatever you're paying me for it's fine but it's all those things, right? It's making that making that well-rounded session. So yeah, don't believe the hype. If you're listening to this and you're, you've been taught not to speak to your clients, don't believe the hype. Like we were talking about before, if you're able to communicate with your client during the session, you find out what the goals are and that you're working toward them, there should not be a time where a client leaves and doesn't tell you why. That should be very rare that that happens. And it's, it's rare for me. I don't know if it's rare for you, Nate. Yeah, I, th I think what I'm finding what's interesting right now is everything that we've put in the category of what maybe makes not a, a bad therapist or not a great therapist, almost we've said actually nothing about like, like actual touch or presentation. Everything's been about communication, listening, presentation of how we look, how we smell, <laughs> right? But that one thing's actually been about putting our hands on somebody. Well, and what was the, we, we had an episode earlier where we talked about the most important thing of massage and the least important aspect of massage. And it was technique, which is touch basically. Pretty interesting, but this goes back to all the research that you and I like to read, which is um, you can help somebody before you even put your hands on them just by all those things. Setting the expectations, doing all the things on warm therapeutic environment, teamwork, all that stuff. You know, if it's done in the first 15 minutes, you've already helped them. Well, let's do a recap, Nate. Let's, let's talk about what's the big takeaway that we talked about today. This was a subtle one. And it's actually just something that you said towards the end. And it's how you wrap up a session. And some of the things like, is there, did we address everything that we needed to address in this session today? And asking those questions. And that was a very subtle thing that you did. And I really love that because, you know, it's sometimes uh, the, the other phrase that I think is a poor phrase that I caught myself on to fix this was, do you have any other questions for me today? And I've, I've, I've like, man, that is a terrible thing to say, right? Because that almost makes it feel like now I'm, I'm done with them you know, right. Do you have anything else for me kind of a thing? And so I've been thinking about that a lot lately over the past six months to a year. And I've, I've changed my own phrasing to back to what you, what you were saying. So that was a really subtle thing that you brought up. So I appreciated that. And that's a huge takeaway, not only for me, but hopefully our listeners. I don't know, man, that was the big one. That was the big one for me, the subtleties, but everything that we've talked about episode 16, it's just becoming one big Quentin Tarantino movie where you're just going to keep seeing the recurring theme front to back, right? Like you said at the end, what's the most important thing and what's the least, the least important thing. Yep. I feel like we talked more about what makes a good massage therapist than a bad massage therapist. But like you said, we could flip it around look at it either way yeah sure could. if you're listening to this podcast we already know that you're a good massage therapist as my good friend kim miller says that's right all right where do we go from there it was good to be back episode 16. episode 16 we're inching closer to this thing we're gonna do for episode 20 where we're gonna get people together and we're gonna have a, a live gathering of massage therapists and we're going to talk about massage therapy things and and we don't have all the details mapped out yet but we're getting closer to that we are so we're going to um once this episode comes out we're looking down the pipe we still have our question opened up which is about prices and how you set your prices so look for that we'll be discussing that on episode 17. let's let viewers get to know the real us for a minute What's something cool that's happening in Ben world that's not massage related, that's not photography related? I was going to go straight to photography. 
that's really been, you know, besides massage, I've really been diving into photography and I really, it's really been helpful just to have kind of a hobby, a, a way to, to kind of relax and just kind of, I don't know, learn something new because I, I mean, like you, I love to learn and massage has been the thing. And I still, I still take classes about massage all the time, but you know, this, this photography thing has been, it's my, it's my go-to man. It's my second Second go to. How about you? Tell me something that the viewers would not know about Nate. Well, I'm glad you asked because <laughs> I've been waiting 15 years to fulfill a bucket list item. I have a bucket list that's about this long and um, I've got like two or three things on it and I'm accomplishing one of them next weekend. So the weekend of May uh, Cinco de Mayo weekend, whatever, you know, ne whatever next weekend is May 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Been waiting 15 years to go to this. I'm heading down to Maryland, uh, right outside Baltimore, to this festival called the M3 Festival. It's going to be year 15. And it's a weekend celebration of the who's who of 80s glam, hair, and rock and roll bands. No way. Two days, I mean... Everyone from like D. Snyder, Brett Michaels, Rat, Quiet Riot, Striper, YNT, Night Ranger, uh, Faster Pussycat, Pretty Boy Floyd, the list goes on. I am just, I feel like a kid. I, I've waited 15 years to go to this festival. The stars aligned and I got, <laughs> man, you can get anything on Amazon. So like it, people dress up like a throwback, like a tribute. So I have like leather studded boots and snakeskin pants and wigs and everything. So we're going to do it next weekend. I cannot so, wait to see so, pictures, videos, everything from that. Yeah, it's going to happen. So I'm pretty, pretty excited to throw back to almost 40 years ago. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Ben and Nate's questions that we ask people on the internet. And how can people find us out there? Just go to our Facebook page called Ben and Nate's questions that we ask people on the internet. Find out the question of the week and interact with us and let us know what you think and submit your own questions. Where else can they listen to us at, Nate? You can watch us on YouTube if you want to watch our episodes. You can also uh, tune into one of your favorite streaming services such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for watching. See you next time.